Well, turn over in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we're going to look at a couple of verses there. I'm going to talk to you today, and we'll continue something I started a few weeks ago on the importance of renewing the mind. The importance of renewing the mind. I tell you, God has got a lot of His preachers, teachers, pastors emphasizing this right now because I believe it's the most important thing after you get born again, after you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, the most important thing for your life is to get in the process. It is a process. Uh, it's something that we have to cooperate with God. God will do it, help us do it, but He he puts the responsibility back on us. It's something that we're going to have to do too. And uh, he will, he'll, as we do what he tells us to do here in his word, then uh, he'll, God will always do his part. Amen. Uh, I'm going to read this uh, in the uh, New Living Translation. I don't know whether we got that up or not. Yes, we do, don't we? Okay, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to your, give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will accept. When you think of what He has done for you, is it too much to ask? Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will know what God wants you to do, and you will know how good and pleasing and perfect His will really is. Amen. Now, that's a process uh, of getting your mind renewed. It's really a lifetime process. Amen. Now, I've, I've seen this as a pastor. I've seen this so many times. When Christians will begin to stop the process... In other words, they will, they will not continue in the Word of God. When they stop the process, they always fall back. I guess the Baptists call that backsliding. I never do like to talk about backsliding because I don't like to teach backsliding because, you know, I found out that people will do what they taught. I'm against backsliding. Amen. <laughs> So if we'll stay in the process of that lifetime process of getting our mind renewed, we will not be falling back, but we'll be making, we'll be making, uh, gaining headway into the things of God, amen, and learning more and doing more and experiencing more of the presence of God in our life. Of course, the problem with a living sacrifice is that sometimes it will crawl off the altar. You, you got, you know, it's a living sacrifice. If we don't stay full of the Word and the Spirit and keep the body under, don't let the body control our life. Let the Spirit, the new Spirit of God that, that we got in the new birth, that new creature in Christ, uh, follow it and the Holy Spirit that's got in it. If we'll do that, then we won't, we won't be crawling off the altar of sacrifice. Amen. We'll be like the Apostle Paul, you know, Paul, the Apostle Paul. If he had, listen, the great Apostle Paul said he, he had to bring his body under. He had to keep his body under less. Having preached to multitudes, I become a castaway. A castaway. We don't want to become a castaway. Of course, this takes the Word and the Spirit for the, to continue this process. We can control our thoughts if we know the Word. Thoughts are going to come. Bad thoughts are going to come. But you don't have to take them. Jesus said, He told us how you take them. Jesus says, take no thought saying. We used to have, an, we had an evangelist that come here, and he, he was a great evangelist. He's going on to be with the Lord now. Matter of fact, we had a real move of the Spirit when we had him here back in 97, 98. 99, and mo if y'all were here, you know who I'm talking about. I won't call his name. But uh, he was, uh, had a bad, he's like me, he, he was, got saved in the Baptist church. And he stayed in the Baptist church, and he got filled with the Holy Ghost. And uh, doors began to open up for him, you know, and 
spirit-filled churches. Uh, and uh, we got him in here just when God had, was really dealing with him and working in his life. But he had this bus because he traveled so he had this big old bus. And uh, he, would, uh, he would always talk about how, how sorry that bus was. Y'all remember that? Yeah, it was here. He'd always talk about how sorry that bus was. As a matter of fact, he says, I know there's a name plate on that thing somewhere where it says it was made in hell. <laughs> I said, brother, you have, you, you, the reason you stay broke down all the time is you, you, you say it. You're taking these thoughts that the devil's bringing to you. Why don't you start blessing that bus? Why don't you start talking about how great that bus is? How great that bus runs? How it don't have to be, it don't, you know, it just, it just runs and runs and runs and no repairs. Amen. I don't know whether he ever stopped or not. Well, he stopped now, that's for sure. He, 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 knows, he, knows, all of, he knows it better than we do now. Amen. The importance of what we say, what, the, what we let our mouth do. You can't thank them from coming. You can't, think the, you can't stop those thoughts from coming, but you should sure don't have to take them. Amen. Amen. We've all heard the saying, if birds will fly over our heads, but we don't have to let them build a nest in our hair. Now, I know some of you don't have to worry about that, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, none of us have to worry about it. Amen? You don't have to let them build a nest or mess. I tell you, I just get so aggravated with them sometimes because I had to park one of my cars out, outside the garage. And with, I don't know, I, I, I get it away from the trees and everything, you know, but still, without exception. The birds love it. <laughs> and now I'm saying it, they're going to continue to love it. <laughs> I plead the blood on that bad seed. See, I don't want to harvest on that seed. I want, I want, to, I want, to, I want, to, reap a, I want to reap a good harvest. So, I, so I've got to, I, I, don't want, I, don't want, I don't want that bad harvest. Amen. I plead the blood on it. All right. We are spirits. We possess a soul and we live in a body. We know that, don't we? Let's say that together. I am a spirit. I possess a soul. I live in a body. Now, the soul we know for sure is the mind, the will, and the emotions. And may, I don't know. The heart may be in there somewhere. Uh, some people think the heart's the spirit. Some people think the, the heart's also in the soul. But uh, we have to be born again because we die spiritually. We die spiritually. Hebrews 12, 9 says, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and paid them respect, and we, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and, a, and live? God is the Father of spirits. We all came from God. As spirit beings, we came into this world as spirit beings. Uh, we, we, we're all a seed. Do you know your seed? You're, you're, the, you're the harvest of a seed that was planted in the womb of your mother. Uh, that's how, we, how, how man gets legally into this world is through a woman. See, Satan's uh, ill, he's here, but he's illegal. He's an outlaw spirit. Jesus came the legal way. He was born of the virgin woman, Mary, that we have such a wonderful account of in the scriptures. But we are spirit beings. We possess a soul. We live in a body. And regardless of what you've heard preachers say, you didn't arrive dead on arrival. You wasn't dead on arrival. When you was born into this world, you, you had a spirit that was still alive to God. The problem is, because he don't have no dead spirits. The problem was, you're born into a world that's cursed with sin. 
and somewhere in your youth, it's going to happen. It happens to us just like it happened to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul says, I was alive once. The commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Now, he, he, he wasn't talking about dying physically, he's talking about dying spiritually. What is spiritual death? Spiritual death is being separated, alienated from the life of God. In other words, somewhere in youth, we all lose the life of God, just as the Apostle Paul did. Every, every person, it, it's, unless they have, uh, their, maybe so, uh, their mind is so mentally retarded. Um, but we all come to a knowledge of what? Good and evil. Somewhere in youth, we become accountable because we get we get we understand what's right and what's wrong. Now you may do a lot of things that's not right, it's wrong before you come to that age, but you're still in an age of innocence because you've not come to that age of accountability. You know, it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that man ate of there in the garden. And that's when we come to the knowledge of good and evil, that uh, sin that is dormant in the flesh, see, the sin nature is passed from one generation to the next generation in the flesh. And it lies dormant in the flesh. See, Paul, that Paul said, sin revived, and I died. The sin was in his flesh, the sin nature, the flesh nature. And it, it became alive and it separated him from God. And that happens to all of us. This is why Jesus came to do what he did for us. Jesus didn't really come to start another religion. The world's full of religion. Religion is man trying to work a way to know God. And it's impossible. Jesus came to show us and be the way to God for us. In other words, He came to, take it, to bring the life of God back to us. That's why He says over in John chapter 3 that you must be born again from above or you'll not see the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus, when He would be ministering, and they would try to pre prevent the little children from coming unto him. He'd say, don't prevent the children from coming unto me. For of such is the kingdom of God. Why did he say, for of such is the kingdom of God? Because they still had the life of God in them. And I've seen this so, and not only did I remember it in my own life, but I see it in the life of children today. Children love God. Children are very sensitive to God. You know why they're still sensitive to God? Little children are sensitive to God until they get to the age of accountability. Because they don't, they don't get filled with all the garbage of the world that we get filled with. Our minds, their minds have not yet been fully programmed with the things of the world. And they can be very sensitive to the things of God. I remember a story that Brother Hagin used to tell us about a friend. This was actually a friend of his, a minister friend. And uh, he had a brother that died. And uh, he, had to, he had to get someone that had a private plane to fly him from where he was living to, uh, for the funeral. Of course, the wife and his child could not go at that time. The child was small. And, uh, but they carried him to the airport, and the plane, of course, they watched the plane take off. And the child said, Mommy, Mommy, don't Daddy know that plane's going to hit that mountain? See, children are very sensitive to the things of the Spirit, to God. And uh, sure enough, that plane hit that mountain, and, and, and of course, the, his father was killed. And the pilot was killed. Children can be very sensitive or are very sensitive to the things of God. I can remember when I was a child. I'm, trying, I'm thinking back probably seven, eight years old. And I would, my, my, I'd go with my, spend my, 
my summers out of school, I would go spend with my granddaddy who had a farm. And uh, he had a church that w we'd go to and real close to his home there. And, and we would uh, we'd have that, they'd have that what they call revival once a year. But, they, but, but they, I can remember their pastor, he only preached twice a Sunday. And the rest of the Sundays, we just had Sunday school in that church. And um, that's where I, I learned that little chorus, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I can remember when I was being prayed for to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they began, they, you know, they act, you know, I'm, I'm a hard-headed Jackson, and uh, after I, I went forward, I, I went forward, I intended to get it. I seen it in the Bible. I knew it was available to me. And they prayed over me, and they prayed over me. And I know they wanted to give up, but I, I just, I would not move. They kept praying for me and praying for me. And finally, one of them, uh, one of the ministers that was sponsoring this particular meeting, he said, let's, let's sing something in the Spirit. And they begin to sing that little chorus, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Now they were singing it in tongues. But, uh, I, knew the, but I knew the chorus, I knew the chorus see, of it. And as they began to sing that, the Spirit of God came on me and just moved through my entire body. And um, I learned that in this church I'm talking about. But we had this fiery, he, had a, he was a big fellow. He was quite, quite large, not this way, but this way too. He was quite tall. And he had a hair, head full of gray hair. I mean, he, it didn't look like he'd lost any of his hair. Just, a, just all totally gray head. I don't know how old he was. He probably wasn't old as I am now. But uh, he, he had this, this, this head just full of gray hair, and he was a fiery preacher. And I remember as a small child sitting down that front row, and knowing that one day I'm going to be a preacher, I'm going to be a preacher, I'm going to be a preacher. Now, I don't think I ever learned to preach as far as he did, but uh, I did learn to be a preacher, amen, a proclaimer of the Word of God, a teacher, a preacher, a proclaimer of the Word of God. So children, we, 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 need, we probably need to get the children in, in our services more and let them pray for us, amen. Amen. Because children are sensitive to God. And somewhat, but the, the problem is somewhere, and this is why it's so important to get, get your children in church. You know, keep your children in church. When they come to that age of accountability, they're going to know the answer. That Jesus is the answer. Amen. Just like we, we found him. I was, I was 32 years old before I got born again. But I can remember them baptizing me when I was 11, 12 years old and in water. And I went down a, a center and I came up a wet center. And, and, and uh, I'd already come to the age of accountability and it didn't take that in that particular church. They, they just, when you got a certain age, when they had that annual revival, then you were supposed to get you're supposed to join the church and get water baptized. And I did that. I joined the church and got water baptized when I was, I think it was 11 years old, 12 years old, something like that. But anyway, when I was 32 years old, of course, after, you know, being full, filled with a lot of garbage, in other words, programmed, so your mind, your brain is like a, the hard drive of a computer and uh, your mind is like the software in a computer. You've been programmed, programmed by the world. This is why when you get born again, so you've got to get reprogrammed, and we've got to get reprogrammed with the Word of God. This, this is the software that we've got to reprogram our minds with, our computers, if you will. We've got to get reprogrammed. And this is what he's talking about here when he says you must you know, you need to get your mind renewed to the things of God. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Glory to God. And let me say this. When you came into the world alive to God, your name was written in the book of life. 
Did you know there's nowhere in the Bible that says when you get born again, you, your name's written in the book of life? Now, they told me that. Oh, when I, get, when I got born again, now your name got written in the book of life. My name was already written in the book of life. It doesn't say it's going to be written in the book of life when you get born again. It talks about it can be blotted out. And what happens is if we leave this life and we've rejected Jesus, our name is blotted out. If we receive Jesus in this life and, we leave, and we, when we leave this life and we are born again of the Spirit of God, we become that new creation spiritually in Christ, then our name's not going to be blotted out. Be absent the bodies to be present with the Lord. Because why? We received Zoe life. We received the God kind of life when we got born again. Spiritually, we got it back. That's what Jesus died for. Raised from the dead for that we could be, once again be justified before a holy God. With the life of God in us. When we accepted Jesus. And what he had done for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? Here's the scripture. Uh, Revelation 3, 5 says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Hallelujah. So it's important that we, when we leave this life, that we be alive to God spiritually. See, everyone's eternal. Every, every, every person is an eternal spirit. The difference is where are we going to spend eternity? Are we going to spend it with God? Or are we going to spend it with the devil in, the lake, in, in, in hell? Amen. Thank you, Lord. So, children's minds are not programmed with the garbage of the world like us adults. So we have to make a greater effort to get our minds cleaned out and reprogrammed with the Word of God. And not doing so is probably one of the greatest hindrance to revival and seeing the great harvest of souls that God wants to have birth into his kingdom before he returns. So how can we know if we are, how can we know we are still being transformed? And the word transform means to be in harmony with something, to be in harmony with something. Uh, so how can we know it? John tells us over in 1 John 2, 16, he says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, the, the message translation really makes this plain to us. It says, The lust of the flesh is wanting your own way. The lust of the eyes is wanting everything for self. The pride of life is wanting to appear important. So, if you've got any of those things working, that means you're still in love with the world. The word transformed is metamorphos in the Greek. It's a, it's a process that we see the caterpillar going through to become a beautiful butterfly. It goes in that cocoon. Well, God's given us a cocoon to consistently stay in. It's called the Word of God. It's called your Bible. Our Bible is that cocoon that He wants us to consistently on a day-to-day -day basis spend some time in the Word of God. To get the Word in us. You've got to spend time in it to get it in you. It's a process. Staying consistently in the Word of God. Hallelujah. That means reading it, studying it, meditating it. Meditate those promises. And if we're not doing that, we're still in harmony with this world age. If we're not staying consistently in the Word of God. Now, we have other things we have to do. We all understand that. 
But I found out we just have to keep a higher level of the Word of God in us than any other word. Any other word. Probably need to quit watching the news. Get in the Bible. Read the Bible. Keep that word of God higher than any other level of any other word. And you'll be all right. You'll be on you'll be you'll be doing good. Amen. Now I wanted to talk about, I only got a few minutes here. I want to talk about some steps to changing or renewing the mind. Some things that we have to do, some steps we need to take in order for this to happen. I had six down. It's very obvious I'm not going to get to my six. I actually got 12. But I knew I, the most I'd get to the day would be six. But I'm not going to get to the six. But I, I want to get into this, and I'll finish it later. Number one, the first step you have to make is make a decision to change. Everybody say decision. decision. See, God has made us free will creatures. God does not make anybody do anything. God, if he does, the whole world would already be saved. And he'd make them tithe too. But he didn't make anybody do anything. He wants us to choose. He wants us to choose to receive what he's done for us through his son Jesus. He wants us to choose the promises of God that he's given us in the Holy Scriptures. We have to make a decision to change because that's what renewing your mind's all about getting your mind changed from the ways of the world to the ways of God Deuteronomy 30 19 says I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death blessing and cursing therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live so what is the decision a decision is an open door into reality. There's power in a decision. God's give you a free will. And next to your spirit is probably the most powerful thing in your life. A will. A free will. And we'll never realize change until a decision is made. Amen. He's not going to make you be a Christian. He wants you to choose to be a Christian. You know, the Bible says there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end of it is death. And see, renewing the mind will keep you from going that way. So we must make that decision daily to stay in that process of getting our mind renewed with the Word of God. Yielding to the Spirit of God to direct our steps. And let me tell you something, if you don't make a decision, you've already made a decision. The wrong decision. Even Joshua, in Joshua 24, 15, he makes this statement. This is, this is, he's fixing to take the children of Israel into the promised land. He says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. See, we choose. We make the decision. God's not going to make it for us. We have to make it. And then the second thing is we need to yield our will to God's will. Totally and completely yield our will to God's will. That's the cross that we've been. Jesus said, you know, you must take up your cross daily. What do you think he meant? He meant when your natural will crosses his divine will, then you, you need, your cross is yielding your will to his divine will. That's something we all take up daily. We have to yield, and if we're going to get our minds renewed, we're going to have to yield our will to God's will. Matthew 26, 26 39, Jesus said, he went a little further and fell on his face praying. This is, this is when Jesus went in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying, Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. 
Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. See, Jesus, as the human part of Jesus, had to yield his, that, that human will he had to the will of the Father. And, of course, he did that. As a matter of fact, he said, I, I do nothing except I, what I see the Father does and what the Father tells me to do. I do nothing except the Father tell me or show me. Amen. And, of course, you know that scripture, we can bring that scripture in. I quoted earlier, Isaiah 119, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Amen. All right, here's a third one here, and this is probably the only one I get in today. But I'll, I'll call the rest of these six out where you can be studying them. Develop a strong desire to change. Well, you say, Pastor, how can I develop a strong desire? Well, he tells us so in Psalms 37, 4, how to develop, a, how, how we can get that strong desire to change. It says, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, he ain't talking about all them things, all them things you've been praying for. That word delight means to be pliable. See, God is the potter. We're supposed to be the clay. That word delight means to be pliable in the hands of the potter. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. In other words, He's going to put His desires in you, and you'll want what He desires. And that's what we need to be seeking after, is developing that strong desire to change. You will never change because someone else wants you to change. The Word will create a desire to change you, to change. As you stay in the Word, as you get more of the Word in you, there'll be a desire to change. And of course, if you submit to the Holy Spirit, He'll, cre he'll create a desire in you to change. I love the scripture on Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do His good pleasure. For it is God which works in us to will and to do His good pleasure. Hallelujah. Delight thyself. Be pliable in the hands of the potter. This is changing. This is renewing your mind. and It's a lifestyle process that we must get into. What you give attention to is what you desire. What you give attention to is what you desire. You give attention to the Word, you give attention to the Spirit of God, and you'll get God's desires working in your life, strongly working. Hallelujah. All right, I'm going to quickly cause these out if you want to write them down. Number four is increase your knowledge base. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Number five, look into the Word as a mirror to change. How many of you got up this morning and you went to a mirror? And you looked in the mirror and you said, oh, there got to be some changes. You know, your hair might be all messed up. And you want to, you you know, straighten your hair out, comb your hair. And uh, before you ladies leave, I know what you ladies get into before you leave the house. You know, you go, you go through all that stuff that ladies go through. And thank God you do look better. You always look a lot better than us men. Amen. So we understand what a mirror is. But God, God the Bible says, uh, the Word of God says, it is a mirror for us to look into. So we need, to have, we, we need to look into the Word as a mirror to change. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with unveiled faces, beholding as a mirror of the glory of God, are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. If you focus on the Word, the Holy Spirit will focus on changing you. Amen. And when you look into the Word of God, you, found, you, you find a mirror that tells you the truth. Tells you the truth. He says, my Word is truth. Number six, diligently apply the truth you know daily. We don't really know something until we begin to apply it. 
begin to live it. Proverbs 12, 24 says, The hand of the diligent will rule, but the lazy man will be put to forced labor. And I love the scripture from John chapter 8, verse 31, 32. If you abide in my word, King James says, If you continue in my word, abide means really to live, to stay in. Stay in my word. If you stay in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Isn't that a wonderful promise? How I many of you want to be free? Amen? But what you learn, you have to apply. Glory to God. Consistency is always the key to breakthrough in anything. Being consistent. Amen.